Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will, will prosper. The prophetic book, I want to put this verse a little bit in context as we know. Uh, for. Uh, the study purpose, we look at the major prophets and the minor prophets, 17 prophetical books uh, in the Bible. And uh, we know that the uh, main thrust of the whole prophetic message or the prophetic office uh, was a call to restoration. Uh, the purpose of God choosing Israel and giving them the law and making a covenant with them was they will be a nation that will glorify God, be a servant to the nations around them, and by following the law, exhibiting the character of God, they will be a cause of glory to God. And God very made, made it very clear to them that when you are connected with me, related with me, uh, my character is going to be reflected through your lives, and that is going to be manifest in your interpersonal relationships and this is very important that the prophets were always calling people to look at their vertical relationship with God which was broken often because instead of worshipping the living God they were turning to idols and nature and all the other things and as a result the love and the character of God that had to come from the true God was not coming into them. And as a result, we see the prophets addressing all kinds of social evil, social stratification, bribery and corruption in the courts, and all kinds of social evils. And the cause for the social evils was that people were not connected with God. They were worshipping things of their own imagination. And even today, that we have this challenge here. It's not that we don't have social evils, a lot of social evils, but the main Focus should be this that are people connected to the true and living God. Now God had mercy and compassion on the people and he raised the prophets. The prophet's job was to remind the people that until and unless you are connected to the true and living God, you are not going to live a meaningful and purposeful life. And of course there is a prediction uh, in the prophecies, a predictive aspect where the prophets uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they say that yes, there is going to be a time when God is going to fulfill his redemptive plan. And that they saw through the Holy Spirit and they prophesied, yes, God is going to do a work of restoration. For example, prophet Isaiah, you have the beautiful servant songs in Isaiah. And what is God saying to prophet Isaiah? That Israel failed as a servant and I am going to send my servant, Jesus, who is going to serve and to lay a standard of what God wants for his people. So here we see in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is prophesying to the southern kingdom. Of course, the southern kingdom, which is called as Judah, is still existing. And we know that during Solomon's son Rehoboam's time, the kingdom was divided into northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And Assyria captured the northern kingdom in 722 BC, just like the prophet said, that if you're not going to follow the Lord, the judgment is coming. And it happened. The Assyrians captured northern kingdom in 722. But the southern kingdom, even though there was a very stable monarchy there, and all from the household of David were ruling there, they were still not pursuing the ways of God. And one thing, friends, this morning we should know is that what God desires, and that is implicit obedience. Obedience is a very, very important thing that God is always seeking. That what has been entrusted to us, are we obeying? 
and that is the step for receiving more from God and often we fail to receive things from God because what God has already entrusted us and revealed to us we fail to obey and God is always calling us and that's the beauty of God that in spite of our rebellion he keeps on loving us hallelujah that's the beauty of his love and his purpose is that we obey what he's saying because only when we obey we are going to enter into all that he has for us the southern kingdom God gave them the law he made a covenant with them they had a stable monarchy everything was fine but they were again backsliding from Jehovah God and several prophets come and warn them that if you're going to follow this way God is going to send his judgment and the people of Israel or the people of Judah the southern kingdom just like the northern kingdom they didn't believe that judgment will come especially the southern kingdom the people said that there can be no judgment here because we have Jerusalem we have the temple but God is warning through the prophets that I am not interested in your temple or, or in your rituals but I'm interested in your relationship with me and that's a very sober truth for us friends that sometimes we can go through the motions of religiosity and go through the motions of everything but our heart is not really connected with God that is a very dangerous thing Gehazi you know the servant of uh, Elisha uh, it says that uh, Naaman the Syrian commander came and uh, God did a very big miracle for Naaman healed him of leprosy and uh, Naaman bought a lot of silver and gold and clothing and uh, he uh, wanted to give it to the prophet and the prophet said nothing doing I don't want any of your gold or silver and uh, surprisingly once he left you know Gehazi it says Gehazi followed Naaman you know and he was pursuing Naaman and trying to say that oh can I get this what can I get you no know? and the interesting thing there was that he was with the prophet he saw the miracles and he was seeing the godly ways uh, Nama, uh, the Elisha was pursuing but it did not affect his life and that is an important truth that we can go through all the motions of religion just like the southern kingdom they had the temple they had all the rituals the sacrifice everything but it was not affecting their practical life and that is a big challenge friends when we look at the whole Levitical priesthood or the offering or the rules and the rituals God had given to the people the core of the issue was that when an Israelite came with his sin offering to the priest and the priest lay the sins and he sacrificed the animal the Israelite should be broken within and say thank you God thank you Yahweh that instead of my sin you have provided a sacrifice and that should result in a brokenness and humility and an attitude of sacrifice which should be reflected in his interpersonal relationship right there in the community but many of the Israelites they were going through all the motions of sacrifice everything but it was not affecting their heart and this morning friends I want to submit this for your consideration that the presence of God your daily devotions with God, your meditating of the scriptures, your prayer, uh, your attending the church, is it affecting your attitude, behavior, uh, your, your character, is it changing you? That is what should be the constant introspection in my life, that am I getting changed? I always tell to the pastor, I think the first thing we need to ask is, am I becoming a better husband? <laughs> The other day I was just taking six, I was taking a tricky one, yes, tricky one, because forget the world, let's start with the homes, that's where the ministry begins. Uh, am I becoming a better person? I think the best person to ask your own wives, you know, and uh, that's a big challenge. So, so I was spending time with 60 CEA pastors, and uh, we were talk talking about the pastor and the family, and it was very interesting to see. Uh, the responses on the family thing the prophet Jeremiah also is telling the southern kingdom that don't play games with God let me tell you we cannot play games with God God is God 
he is a loving God. But when he sees sin, he will judge. But when there is repentance, there is also restoration. And that is what we see the pattern from the book of Genesis. That God is a holy God and man sins, God judges. But at the same time, there is a plan for restoration. And prophet Jeremiah also is talking about coming God's judgment. And we know that in 587 BC, the Babylonians plundered Jerusalem. They captured Jerusalem. And the captives were taken and the situation was so pathetic. A lot of exiles went to Babylon. And here in Babylon, they are wondering what we should do. What we should do. What should we do in Babylon? What should we do in the city where God has sent us? Or we have come here because of our sins and because of the exile. And here is a message. And I think basically my message today is I want to tell you that why has God placed us in a city like Gurgaon? And friends that we as a church, if God has placed us in the city, whether it's New Delhi or Gurgaon or any other city, there is a purpose. There is a purpose that God has for us. It's not simply to play church and be happy. No, there is a purpose to be available for what God wants us to do. And I want to present this message by saying some important truths that first, that the God we serve is the Lord of history. And what I mean by that, he is in absolute control of history. Means he is orchestrating history and he is taking history to the desired goal. He is the God who is in absolute control. Amen. You are all wondering, is it true? Yes. Praise the Lord. It is true. In the book of Daniel it says that God is the one sovereign. You know, the uh, Babylonian king, um, you know, they were like celebrating their greatness and all that. And, you know, God humbles him and the king himself acknowledges that the kingdom belongs to the most high. Yes. And that's something that we should be very clear that the kingdom mm -hmm. belongs to him and he knows whom to establish and whom to put down. He's in control and God, we serve. He will ensure that worship will come to him from every nation. That is, God will redeem people from every people group, from every language group, from every urban group, and from every geographical group. That is the purposes of God. And he will overcome evil powers in order to bring things under his governance. He will overcome all the evil things. To bring everything under his governance. That is the God we serve. And that's the God we worship. Now, when we look at the whole sociological phenomenon of urbanization and migration, it's mind-boggling. I was reading the statistics. By 2050, 6 billion people or 66% of the world's population will live in cities. 66% of the world's population will live in cities and cities are like magnets. They're drawing people, you know, from different places, different places. They're drawing people into the city and not only from different places, from different countries. And I was reading the statistics on Delhi NCR with over two crore population is the fifth most populous city in the world. The fifth most populous city in the world. So cities are fast expanding. And not only people from the hinterland are coming, but people from other nations are coming. Yes. We, had, we just, I heard in the testimony of this brother, I'm from Singapore and I'm from Korea. And my goodness, what a melting pot. It's amazing. And uh, I had the privilege of partnering with uh, this uh, Back to Jerusalem moment in China through a dear friend, Pastor Banoj. And uh, I was there and... Uh, there is this brother, David Thien. David invited me. There was a cottage meeting in his home. And he said, Pastor Laji, since you're in the city uh, teaching the Bible school, come home for a cottage meeting. So there was, I reached there and there were 35 people there for that cottage meeting, uh, house uh, fellowship in his home in Shanghai city. And 30 people were from 30 different countries. Wow. 
it was mind boggling and I started introducing and getting to know them and some said I'm from Africa, some said I'm from Europe, I am from US, what are you doing, come for studies, for business, the company has transferred. But you see this whole process of migration, might be it is global migration or internal migration, God is bringing people into his kingdom. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Jason Mandrick has written a book, Operation World. I will encourage those of you who are serious for prayer. It will be good for the church intercession also. You get it in OM. He says that there are 300 to 400 million people on the move in the world. And what is God doing? And through this move, God is drawing them into his kingdom. He's revealing, that's what I said in the beginning, that he's ensuring that worship will come to him from every nation. And God will redeem people coming to Gurgaon. Of course, I'm, I'm supposed to say Guru Gram, correct? <laughs> Guru Dronacharya. And it was very interesting to know this was a land given to Guru Dronacharya by his disciples as a Guru Dakshina or a teaching fee. You know, in Mahabharata era and that's why it is called Guru Gram now, teacher's village. And the history says here that the economic growth started in 70s when Maruti Suzuki started a factory. And the amazing thing is today it has more than 250 Fortune 500 companies. Might be it's old uh, statistics, but this I was amazed to read that more than 250 Fortune 500 companies. And the statistics says that Gurgaon will have a population of 69 lakh by 2031. And what am I trying to say in this? Understanding the city where God has placed us, church, is very, very important. And that's when we will try to realize and pray, God, what is your purpose? What is your purpose in bringing me to Guru? Or what is your purpose in placing me in this city? And might be several of you might travel to many other cities, but I let me challenge you that I want to challenge you that do try to understand the place where God has kept you. Because God is concerned for the cities. So as people of God, we need to understand the places or the cities where we are. Now look at one verse in uh, the book of Jonah, uh, chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, it says here about Nineveh. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And many cattle as well. And it says, should I not be concerned about that great city? Now, you know the, pro you know the problem that Prophet Jonah had, you know. Uh, uh, the creation, you know, the, uh, the storms, the winds, the whale... Uh, and everybody was obeying Yahweh, but Jonah, the prophet, was disobeying Yahweh. That's the paradox here. And the problem with Jonah is that he, had, he was possessed with some kind of uh, selfish patriotism and uh, religious bigotry, you know. The selfish patriotism that only we will be saved, the Jews will be saved, you know. Uh, and also the superiority complex. In, in, in cultural anthropology, there's a term... Um, uh, ethnocentricity that uh, my culture is the best we are the best uh, and only thing we will be saved um, after a graduation from uh, Southern Asia Bible College very prayerfully me and my wife decided to go to Bihar and it was very amazing to hear responses from our relatives my father-in-law said where are you taking my daughter Wow. Of course, we had a uh, baby, our uh, daughter, eldest daughter Deepa was six months that time. And she said, where are you going? And so, as another one relative said, you have only that God forsaken place to go. Mm -hmm. I said, my God, how can you say that? It's God forsaken. I was shocked. They had the feeling that everything can happen only there or that place is God forsaken or those people can never come to the Lord. Let me tell you, friends. We are no one to write off anybody from the kingdom of God. Yes, yes. God's heart is big. 
and we love to receive things from the big heart of God but we often fail to pray God give me that heart in me we need to pray God that big heart that you have give it to me that I can love people and I will not restrict your work from any group of people no matter whatever state they are whatever condition they are God is having a heart for cities God's burden is for cities we need to understand who are the people who come into the city the first is the mega elite class about 15 percent they are influential people and sociologists call them as dings I think many of you know dings double income no kids yeah and dims and so many things are there but dings very common you know both husband and wife uh, they're influential they have a lot of money and they say come on we don't want a family we want to enjoy life you know they are the mega elite class 15 person influential they need God they need God not only the marginalized not only the poor not only the Jogi Jopri the elite the mega elite need several years back you know Pastor Sam had an outreach for Green Park area and few of us also joined few of us from the church we also said we'll also join for their outreach and it was I still vividly remember we used to go to houses and press the bell so that we could meet the people and suddenly we hear a voice from the post hello yes please tell why are you here we are not able to meet anybody only a voice we have come here to share about Jesus okay put your material in the post box and please go away <laughs> wow very interpersonal <laughs> but, uh, impersonal not able to speak to anybody and it was very difficult to meet people or some gates you go and this big dogs coming to attack you and you run for your life and I remember one place we went I think it was Matthews uh, Vinu I think uh, was uh, went to a place and he was there was a security guard he said why did you come he said I have come we have come here to speak about God he said I am God <laughs> And Matthews was totally put about. Actually, he was saying, I am the guard, you know. <laughs> so, so he, got, he got a confusion and there was a big, so Matthew was put about, my God, I am coming here to speak about God and here is a God here. So, so when you look at the, uh, at, the, at the mega elite class, 15 person, they are influential, they are, they are the opinion makers. There is a huge vacuum inside them. Yes. I don't know whether it's mega light or not, but I don't know how many of you really read about this 11 mass suicide that happened in Burari. Yes. Me and my wife wept. We are not connected, but can such a thing happen in the city with all this intercession going on? And one of our Bible school graduates is in Burari there, and I met him, Uman Abraham, I met him for a night prayer and I said what happened Abraham what do you think and he told me a very challenging thing he said that few months back he was sitting in prayer and God said the land is so full of wickedness and lot full of idolatry that my judgment is going to come he said I wept he said I wept God spare the land it's not that we are happy that God's judgment should come and we are righteous no the sin there is because of us and we are responsible to stand in the gap. And he was saying, he stood in the gap and he said, Pastor, you should come and see the Bengali colony there. He said, you cannot enter the colony. There is full of idolatry, different kinds of vices. Every house practices witchcraft and black magic and it's terrible. And I asked, is there any way that this family was under financial pressure that they committed so he said, Mas, he said, no, absolutely not. Financially, they were very well sound. But what happened? They started hearing voices. And then finally, they committed suicide. They are the rich. They are the influential people. They, they were economically powerful. Now, let me tell you that we cannot say that they are not going to come to the Lord. God is sovereign. A couple of years back, there was this Joyce Mayer who came to Tiagrat Stadium for a meeting and I had the opportunity to translate for her, translate a message and I had the opportunity to interact with people. And it's amazing, I saw that 
all business people, highly influential people, even right as far as from Shimla, Chandigarh, they have come. And I asked them that, how did you come? He said, we have closed our factory where comes the whole family because we hear Madam's message. It comes to our home in Punjabi. Wow, I said, amazing. Here we are in Green Park, unable to give them the track, but God is sending his message into their homes. Hallelujah. Because God loves them. They are beautiful and precious in his sight. And if they think that they can be satisfied with the money, many times they are totally frustrated. They are looking for reality. And 15%, you know, we are trying to look at the breakup of an urban population. At least 15% are influential. And then we have the middle class people, 30%. They are helpless. They are working. A middle class of 30%, a very strategic group. And then we have a migrant class of 10%. They are very strategic. Very strategic. Then we have a marginalized class of 45% people. They are accessible. They are very, very crucial. So when we look at the city, when we look at the city, often we are myopic in our vision in the sense we, we tend to look only at our people. But we need to ask the Lord to enlarge our vision, our understanding of where we are so that we can look at the people around us. And uh, this happened a couple of years back when in the place we were staying, there was a caretaker right in the opposite, opposite building. That building was being constructed. And we had a talk and uh, there was a talk and we came to know he was saying that every day he's able to eat three chapatis. And the chapati, he says, that how do they eat? They take, uh, they bake the chapati, sukha chapatis, and they put uh, salt, apply salt on that and eat. And he says, if I get an onion, if I'm able to buy a green chili, it's a luxury for me. And we were shocked. Because he is not able to get enough job daily. He's surviving. And we were, we were shocked. We were seeing at one side so much affluence. On the other side, we have so much marginalized, poor, and underprivileged people. So what is our city like? We need to know. Along with this population breakup, there are several threats in a city and places where large populations are there. And I'm sure that you know that go the government is planning Gurgaon and Maneshar, you know, as a twin cities. Uh, uh, and there's going to be a huge, huge population influx from all over the nation and also from abroad. But what are the threats we see? We have huge threats in an urban environment. Abortions are 10 million now. One crore abortions, you know, happening in a city, uh, you know, in the city atmosphere. Depression is one of the most rampant diseases. Uh, mental illness. The other day I was in Nagpur. I was talking to this uh, brother whose wife is a clinical psychologist. She says that the whole process of urbanization is uh, leading into huge, huge mental imbalances and depression. Four out of ten urban teenagers are suffering from depression and emotional abnormality. From 15 to 30 percent of the school children are going through this. Now, urbanization is good, migration is good, people look for a higher standard of living, very good, but there are a lot of challenges. And as a church, what can we do for that? That's something that we need to look. As a church, let me tell you about God's own country, Kerala, where I was there. And there was the city of <laughs> Chengandur, where they invited me to preach in a church. Dr. Ajit invited me to preach in the church. And after that, I was talking to their uh, pastoral team. And I was telling them, how is the work going on? And they told me a very interesting thing. They did a systematic evangelism program for that whole area. And uh, this brother, I think he's Manoj, working with Mal Malayalam Manorama. He's the lead of the team. And he was telling pastor, it's very, very shocking if I tell you this. I said, what? He said that out of every third house we went, people were on antidepressants, 
sleeping pills, different kinds of psychosomatic disorders. I said, what? He said, yes. And the surprising thing he said, many pastors also are like this. <laughs> I said, God have mercy. And he said that people, huge houses, affluence, there is no lack. But then people are tormented mentally. They don't get sleep and they are, they are trying to find, you know, remedies. And of course, you know, in Kerala, I think, because not only in Kerala, everywhere we have this shame and honor culture. So uh, many times things are just wrapped up instead of seeking help. And he was telling that as a church, you know, what we are trying to address these issues. One rape or abuse every 35 minutes. And I don't have to tell you that good gown is very notorious. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Statistics say. Crime against women. Delhi. I was in China and one, one student said, Pastor, we'd like to come to Delhi, but we are afraid of Delhi. Mm. Wow. That's the condition. And what is happening is these are the threats that we are seeing. It's not that we are going to address these issues once it happens. But can we as a church or God's people be proactive in doing things? That is the question before us. Abortions, depression, emotional abnormality, rape, abuse and all this. And also we see many of the young people, what are they doing to fill their spiritual and moral vacuum? What are they doing? Either they are turning to secular humanism. Oh, everything is okay. No absolute standards, you know. We will live according to what we want. Everything is okay. Do what is what you think is good. And at the extremes, we have many youth embracing traditional Hinduism or militant Islam. You know, there is a huge gap, a spiritual and moral vacuum. And we are seeing that people moving out of the plan God has for them. Like I said, that God desires every people to come into his redemptive blessing. And church, we have a big responsibility for that. As God's people, what should we do? That is the big question which is before us. What should we do? I think we should remind ourselves in 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, what it says. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. I think one thing is that we are very clear that we know that we are here. And we are not here as permanent citizens, but we are strangers and pilgrims. And God has placed us here for a purpose in this spiritual journey. And when we are looking at this passage, when Jeremiah is speaking to the people, the people are trying to make meaning. Why are we in Babylon? What is the purpose here? Oh, should we be isolated? Should we make ghettos and be here because the land is full of idolatry, full of black magic and all these things and we are going to be the holy people here. And often that's the mentality of God's people and the church. But then we need to think that we are called to be the salt and the light. We are called to permeate. We are called to reveal the glory of the Lord and where, where do we do it? So we need to look. So here God is speaking to the people, to the exiles in Babylon, what should be your response? How are you going to understand this place where I put you? And this is, I think, some lessons that we can learn. And I'd like to point this out and also finally close with some takeaways that what we can apply in our life here and today. So verse 7, it says, seek. It says here in verse 7 in my text, Jeremiah chapter 29 verse seven. Uh, verse 7 yeah it says seek it says seek pray it's the seek this word is 
uh, that God is saying that don't be bitter. No, don't keep complaining about your city. Oh, don't say this. Don't say that. Don't be also resentful. Or also you can be very cynical, you know, about this. Oh, this is never going to work. And especially, you know, as God's people, we should be careful, you know. Because uh, many times our prayer, if it is not aligning with our confession, then we are pouring water on what we are praying for. Whether it's with our spouses or our children, or whether it's our cities, you know, we need to try to align uh, our prayers with what God is speaking in his word about our places. And that's very important. That's when, when, when we uh, release uh, God's blessings and uh, God's favor. It says here that seek, seek, it says. And uh, of course, when we look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, uh, Deuteronomy, as you know, is a repetition of the law. Uh, the law was given only once we read about that in Exodus, but here it is a repetition of the law so that the people who are going to the promised land, they're reminded that how important it is to be obedient to what God has said. And in this repetition, we look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29. Yeah, there you will worship man made gods of wood stone, which cannot see, hear, or smell. But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him. If you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, I think I want to just very um, submit this uh, statement with a lot of humility before you. Not, not with an attitude of condemnation. Please realize this, that because we also pray for the city. Now, why is God against idolatry? That's something that we need to think. Why is God against idolatry? See, India has a lot of idolatry. But let me tell you, the people are very devout. Their devotions and their passion, they are not like weak. Like a few years back when I went to Kumbh Mela, I saw these millions of people, you know, passionate somehow. And I wish that, oh, their worship would come to the Lamb who is worthy of worship. That's what is there. Now, why is God against idol worship? My parents come from a tradition, a Syrian Jacobite family, where we worship Mother Mary. We worship the saints. Even now, when I go to Kerala, I connect with my uh, cousin. You know, he walks all the way to uh, Parimala. You know, there is one church, you know, where the saint is supposed to offer. He says, I walk. So I'm trying to speak to him about the kingdom that is the tradition we ca came from you know so we are not condemning idolatry but i'm condemning idolatry in the sense that we are not saying oh all those people but we are trying to see that why is god against idol we need to understand that anything we make if with our hands is not going to be higher than us it's going to be lower than us and if you're going to worship a true god a living god who has created us that's when we are going to reflect his image and likeness. Now, if we are going to worship something created by us, and it need not be idol, idol can be in any form. It can be various idols. It can be materialism. It can be our career. It can be our, the idols of our choice that we are worshipping secretly. And let me tell you that any time you're going to do that, you're not going to move in the direction that God wants you to be. Now look at India, there is a lot of devotion, but then there is a lack of character. Where is the character? I don't have to tell you, thanks to WhatsApp, we know that what all is being corrupted. Hmm? The food is corrupted, everything is staying, adulteration, this, that, everything is like in a mess. Shows basically the pathetic condition of man. Now, God is telling to the people that, see that word seek, it says here, that if you seek the Lord your God, you will find him. What God is saying that I am available to transform your life, to change you. You don't have to seek any other thing. And this morning church, let me respectfully put to you that what are you seeking? When you come to the house of God, when you gather as a community, what are we seeking? Are we seeking the temporal or are we seeking the eternal? I think if the kingdom DNA is not coming into us, it should come to us. And when I say kingdom DNA, I'm borrowing this term from Ed Silviso, who has written this book, Transformation. You know, 
he says about the kingdom DNA and the kingdom DNA I think I can define it like this the passion for the kingdom because the kingdoms of this world are perishing only the kingdom of God will continue to grow Amen. we are absolutely convinced about that that conviction should come into our life and God is telling to his people that I will bless you with the land a land that is full of milk and honey that is a prosperous land I will bless you I intend to bless you why so that you are a blessing for others that's the key and the plan of God begins when we become a blessing so when we look at Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 7 it says seek you cannot be like I said bitter or resentful or cynical but seek and again in Isaiah 55 6 seek the Lord while he may be found call on him while he is near let the wicked forsake his way and let the evil man his thoughts let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to a God for he will freely pardon now this is what seeking means that we are not saying God they have sinned like Daniel and Nehemiah and Ezra we say God we have sinned forgive us if there is wickedness in the land we have sinned and that is the seeking and also of course the implication here God is saying to his people that no anti-national activity or revolt but prayer today we are living in a time when religion is equated with patriotism quite unfortunate and let me tell you as a church we really are passionate and proud about our country and our prayer is that it will be one of the nations that will grow and be a blessing but here we are seeing here the prophet Jeremiah is telling to the people that seek the Lord uh, Romans 13 uh, 1 to 6 he talks about submission to authorities he says that everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established the authorities that exist have been established by God and he says that consequently he who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves for rulers hold no terror for those who do right but for those who do wrong and then he's going ahead about the submission to the authorities and then first Timothy 2 1 and 2 also is a very familiar verse about standing in the gap for the rulers and authorities that we are praying for who are leading our nation first Timothy 2 1 and 2 also we read that I ask then first of all request prayers intercessions and thanksgiving be made for everyone for kings and for all those in authority that we may live a peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness so I think the first thing that we need to do to see the blessings of God coming on the city is to pray and often I go to the church morning six o'clock or seven o'clock and I sit there with Prince whom we are mentoring and we pray we cry for the people friends we have to cry for the nation we have to cry for the people because until God is working in the lives of the people nothing of our efforts are going to make any difference we might have so many things we might have so many strategies but we need the presence of God and now this word earnest when it says uh, James talk about Elijah earnestly praying there is a fervency there is an urgency and there is a passion it, it comes out of his heart it caught his heart you know oh God without you nothing is going to happen and that's when I think I think the church is praying you have a prayer for the city and that that kind of prayer should be there that God we need your intervention we need you to work look at the prophets whether prophet Jeremiah in chapter 9 1 he's talking about all this uh, coming judgment and God's plan of restoration but the interesting thing there in chapter 9 verse 1 he says that oh that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears that I would weep day and night for the slain of my people now look at all these prophets now prophet Jeremiah or prophet Ezekiel in chapter 9 8 or Amos in chapter 7 when he's look, seeing this big vision 
all these prophets you know when they saw the calamity happening or the destruction happening they were not very proud oh yes we prophesied and it happened no no and sometimes when there is a calamity we'll say oh people sin that's why it happened no we better get on our face and fall and cry before god and that is what is called the earnestness the seeking seeking aspect standing in the gap amos is saying god of israel if you judge uh, jacob is just a small worm he's a person how can he stand that is the intercession god if you judge lord if you take account how can we survive and the prophets throughout we see including jeremiah they were people who were crying out to god and the next part we see here in verse 7 is seek the peace and the prosperity of the city and the word welfare and the word prosperity is the hebrew word shalom that's a very comprehensive word seek the shalom the wholeness the transformation the peace and the well-being of the city now as a church we need to contribute to the growth and the upliftment of the city and one place that always fascinates me is ames in delhi and when i go there i watch very intently i see these people sitting on curbs and uh, cooking their meals you know and my wife says your eyes only goes all that places nothing else you have to see i said i don't know i i my in front of my eyes see i see this poor man's they don't have even a stove they're gathering the twigs and the firewood and they're cooking a meal they cannot stay in yusuf sarai or any other place they are struggling there they they are surviving there but i was surprised to see that of late i'm seeing people distributing food there and i think it's the gurudwara committee not the church <laughs> sisters of my church said we have to do but they said we don't have vision to go they are talking about tb hospital so one caterer brother said 25 rupees i'll make you a lunch and give you something they are planning like that but let me tell you these are the hot spots of the city gurgaon is not far behind you know there are so many people when we eat our pizzas and burgers they don't even have a meal a day they're going hungry please enjoy your pizza and burger <laughs> do enjoy it but also a responsibility to contribute to the growth and the upliftment of the people we need to constantly like we saw earnestly pray and also seek to bless the city and church let me tell you we don't need programs but we need ministries that will bless lives we don't need programs so many programs happen but ministry that will bless lives coming back to jeremiah chapter 29 when you read that passage again from verse 11 to 14 God is saying a very interesting thing to the people. God is speaking to them, I want you to seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you. And then God is saying to them, the be be careful of the false prophets. There are a lot of false prophets. And what are the false prophets saying always? Oh, God will bless you. God has kept you to be blessed and prosperous and he will abound you. Great, fantastic. We all like good. We like to hear that message. It's wonderful. But that's not enough. He says God says be careful. Don't listen to all that things. Don't listen to only prosperity gospel and things concerning your blessing. But God says that when you do that, he says that at the appointed time I'll restore you. and then in verse 11 he says for i know that the plans i have for you declare the lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you a hope and a future what god is telling to the people if you pursue and chase the dreams and the desires of my heart everything will be well with you because you are committed to me and my plans i am committed to you 
and to establish you. And that's the basic truth God is telling to Israel. That if you become for my glory, that when you reflect my character by obeying my law, and when you serve, you become a servant to the nations around you. And that's when I am committed to bless your land and to make you not the tail but the head. And to make you a blessing and to protect you from all harm and danger. Now in one place, the people of Israel should be afraid is, they were doing idolatry back home, but here, this place, what you can say, the mother of all idolatry. <laughs> there is gross immorality, there is lot of witchcraft, all kinds of, all kinds of evil practices, Satan, worship, everything is in Babylon. But God's word reveals that God doesn't need many people there. One Daniel was in a forgotten. Let me tell you, friends, the city or the place we live might have a lot of vices and a lot of things that we, sometimes we don't even know what's happening. But let me tell you, the blessing of the land is because of the remnant righteous in the land. God has mercy on the land because there are, there are some righteous people who are crying and standing in the gap and saying, God, through my life, it's not only through a prayer, my life, my life of righteousness and commitment to justice and mercy and to be an instrument of you is the answer. It is the answer. Many times you might think, what difference it will make? It is going to make a huge difference, friends. Be faithful and leave the results to God. God is saying that I know the plans for you. If you are there and if you seek the prosperity and the shalom of the city and as God's people you do what, you, what I want you to do, that you will be a blessing. Now let me, what should we do as God's people? Bless the city and the places wherever you are and wherever you go. Very important people of God. Don't say what difference my prayer will make. It will make a huge difference. Because you are the kingdom of priests, the royal priesthood, as Peter says. The same thought in Exodus 19. God is telling to the people, the whole earth is mine, but you are a chosen people, the kingdom of priests. Because you are my people, when you pray, I will answer. God's people, when we pray, those prayers are powerful. But what should we pray? Wherever you go in the city, bless that place. God, let your shalom come here. All your servants who are working here will prosper. God, your kingdom will come here, Lord. That is what we should pray. Bless the city and the places where you go. Let me tell you, friends, the world is focused on self-promotion and self-protection. But as part of the kingdom, we are called to be sacrificial. I don't know, might be a place like Gurgaon where there is a corporate culture here. Lot of self-promotion and self-protection. And sometimes we also get into that groove. And I think taking up the cross, that's what I think is my, my understanding, which I want to just humbly submit to you, is that this I, the ego, is always there. And as God's people, we always say, I want to do things, Lord, but not my will, let your will be done. That's painful. That time, that sacrifice, that commitment is painful. So firstly, as God's people, let us bless the city and the places wherever we travel, wherever we go, our offices, the areas where the offices are blessed. You know, as God's people bless, pronounce a blessing on that place and ask God's kingdom, shalom, to come there. And I don't have to tell you that the kingdom of God the great king rules in us. And he has told us that when we are to pray, what we have to pray. Let your name be honored, Lord, in this place. If there is wise crime, God, we want to see your name honored, your will being done, and your kingdom coming here. And let me tell you, any serious prayer, God will make you a part of the answer. That's why many don't want to pray. Yeah. If you're seriously praying, God will make you a part of the answer. Nehemiah was praying and weeping. God, Jerusalem is broken. God said, Nehemiah, pack your bags. 
go be a part of the answer god is very humorous he makes us a part of the answer and that's why we are here like we say lord i am available and says that's what when we pray the second thing we need to is embrace the incarnational model of service humility and simple lifestyle i am putting this out of my little experience in the ministry and some of this might be difficult for you to grapple but i'll like you to seriously think and pray about this the first thing is blessing the city and the places where you go seeking the blessing the prosperity the shalom the transformation and the second thing is embracing the incarnational model of service humility and simple lifestyle i was in ntc talking to george chavanakamanil and he was talking about his son finny kurvilla who is a, a chemistry phd from harvard and then he went on to do his medicine and then he went on to do some other degree and then he started a mutual fund company and i was amazed he says one of the it's one of the top 10 trending mutual funds in us i was amazed with this young man you know and what his dad was telling me that we have to purchase clothes for our grandchildren otherwise they will look very poor i said what he said that my son is quite affluent well off but his passion is the kingdom he said we are enough you know ron sider has written a book rich christians in an age of hunger i'll encourage you to read that book it's an amazing book rich christians in an age of hunger and dr jacob cherry and a good friend of mine in sabc he visited ron sider he was one of the professors he teaches in several colleges about poverty and global uh, funding and how global funding is creating poverty and all that he talks about and he said that when i went to meet ron sider i was amazed what he has written is in his book is practices millionaire he's he has royalty with so many money and everything but you know what what he's totally passionate about the kingdom so embrace the incarnational model of service and when i talk about service friends we should be ready to wash the feet of each other if we are not going to be ready to wash the feet of others we are not going to make an impact friends we are not going to make an impact we are here to serve look at jesus in john 13 he says that jesus knew what the father has entrusted to his hands he knew where he came from where he went means absolute security in god which put him in a place that he could serve why we are not able to serve security issues significance issues the moment we know that god is our security we are ready to serve now quickly let me remind you that if we look at john chapter 1 verse 14 it says that he was full of truth he was full of grace jesus and john writes that we beheld his glory what is that glory that glory is no was not a halo on jesus head it was the fact that if anybody came to jesus they could see the grace of god that's a beauty if anybody comes near us in the city whether it's the poorest migrant or the rich influential person what we should flaunt not our degrees not our charisma not our talents nothing they should say hey here is a guy who has the grace of god and there is hope for me wow hallelujah that's what john burke writes in his unshockable love he says that what was the different there were religious leaders scholars in jesus time but all the hurting people the weak people they came to jesus because they saw in him an embodiment of god's love what do people see in us full of grace and truth only makes us transparent that we embrace integrity no compromise we try to see and pray that god we are not perfect but please help us to live what we preach and believe in there is no dichotomy oh lord people of integrity and look at jesus life you know because because jesus was full of grace and truth only he could take time for the people on margins 
Look at that big Jairus daughter. Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. He's all, uh, his my name is mentioned. His daughter was sick and he said, Jesus come and Jesus is going. And suddenly this poor woman who has no identity, nobody, issue of blood for 12 years, socially, uh, totally boycotted everything. She has no identity, anything. She is a person on the margins. But Jesus took time for her. Hallelujah. That's the love of the Lord. He took time for her. And gave her an identity, said daughter. Nobody even was willing to touch her. But Jesus said, daughter, go your way. That is what as God's people, when we embrace the incarnational model of service, humility and simple lifestyle. And for this, let me tell you friends. If we want to bless the city and uh, work for the transformation, we need to embrace the incarnation. For this, you need to commit yourself to the local church for discipleship, biblical teaching and training. Yes. Let me tell you, you, you look at Acts. You look at Acts. It's very interesting. You look at all the cities with New Testament where Paul was targeting. Philippi, leading city of Macedonia, Acts 16. Thessalonica, large influential commercial city in Acts 17, 1 to 10. Corinth, a commercial metropolis of Greece, Acts 18. Ephesus, strategic port and trading center. Key, key urban areas, you know, Paul was hitting. Corinth, look at Corinth. Corinth was, uh, was a very influential strategic port and trading center. And there were 11 temples there. And the main temple was the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. There was sacred prostitutes on the street all kinds of vices on that street but what is God saying to Paul Paul keep preaching in the city because I have a work to do there what is God's answer for the evil in the city the church the local church is God's answer friends because it's the visible expression of God's kingdom on the earth it is God's community here so we have to be passionate about the local church, committed for discipleship, for teaching, for training, partnering, you know, and not live in the local church with the body of Christ. When we pray, we don't pray only for our local churches, you know. It doesn't become a brand, east or west, this is the best. Forget it, man. The kingdom of God is the best, not our church, it's a small church. I tell my church that come on have a broader vision we need to pray for the global church the church in India the church in Delhi we are not going to impact the city thinking that we are going to do it no we need to partner we need to partner and that's what happens when we go into the deep as a man of God was telling when we go into the deep when Peter went into the deep what he said hey so much fish come on call the other people come on we need to get it together we cannot do it alone. There are many people who are doing excellent work which we need not do. We can just partner with them, strengthen their hands. And that's when we are going to make an impact together. And that's going to be a beautiful, beautiful model. The final thing is understand the tears of the different sections of the people. Understand the tears of the different sections of the people. Instead of Grasping for our own wants and needs, we esteem the needs and well-being of others instead of grasping, you know. For our own wants and needs, we are, instead of straining, we esteem the needs and well-being of others. Let's ask the Lord, Lord, give a sensitive heart and an eyes that can see from you, your viewpoint.